So hi, welcome to Get Ahead, How to Exceed Expectations as an Environmental Professional, also known as Excelling as an Environmental Professional or any other of the six titles I gave this thing during the marketing. <laughs> um, this is for anybody who has just got a new job, is looking for a job, has been working, wants to figure out how they can better advance. And this is our agenda for the evening. I'm going to go through introductions and then talk about the purpose of this webinar. I'm going to introduce the handout. If you jump over to handouts on the top right, you'll get a four page document that leads you from an activity called a SWOT analysis it's to a personal development plan. And then we will talk about some essential skills and behaviors that you could use to populate that list. And then we're gonna interview Leslie Tice and then we'll follow up with Q&A and then wrap it up. So I am Laura Thorne, I'm the Environmental Career Coach, I'm the past president of the Tampa Bay Association of Environmental Professionals and founder of this Environmental Career Coach, which provides online and in-person coaching services. And I've been, I actually just resigned since I moved to Syracuse from New York last year um, as the leader of the Women in STEM Environmental Careers, in, which is in Tampa in conjunction with the TBAP. Uh, we started that in 2015. Last month, we just had our third event, third annual event, and it was sold out in a day and a half, which was awesome. And then I've been doing environmental science for 13 years. And um, since moving to Syracuse and resigning from TBAP, I've now been working with the National Association of Environmental Professionals. And that's how I met Leslie. <laughs> and um, I'm a certified project manager and also a business owner. I run a business consulting firm. So let's jump over to Leslie. I'm gonna let her introduce herself. <laughs> Hi, Leslie Tice. Uh, I'm the environmental business class leader at HDR, and that's just a very long HDR type of name for um, a practice leader. So I lead our, um, and for Northern California, I lead a team of about 60 scientists, planners, uh, transportation planners, and environmental um, biologists, uh, our, um, cultural specialists, and um, anything environmental, and, and lead that and work with a broader team of, of HDR in order to um, uh, manage the projects, manage the quality that we're putting out, develop our team, and um, um, win new work and keep the business running from that standpoint, continue to grow in a smart way. So this topic is is a daily um, task for me and, and one that, you know, we've kind of gone around the, the block on it and on what really, who really stands out in these um, arenas and who really, you know, what, what are those fatal flaws that you can exhibit. So Laura and I have had a lot of good conversations around that. In addition to that, um, I'm a certified environmental professional with the uh, APSEP Academy Board Certified Environmental Professionals Organization. And I've also had um, NAEP and, and our California chapter of AEP as a mainstay since the beginning of my career. So that's been um, something that's kind of carried me through um, a lot of love for that on how um, you can really optimize your networking and your, um, you know, organizational involvement uh, just to really, really benefit you and your career. So um, that kind of leads into this discussion. Absolutely. And that's why we wanted to have you here is because you do this day in and day out and know mm -hmm. from experience what you've seen. And then um, as also a member of NAP and proponent for it. I um, always try to encourage that as far as networking goes for people looking for jobs in the environmental field. Um, goals for this webinar, ultimately, at the end of the day, we wanna help you succeed in your current job, your next job, getting your promotion, and then throughout your career. And we'll do that by introducing you to the situ situational awareness tool called the SWOT analysis, which I'll get into in the next slide or two and then introduce you to the concept of a personal development plan. Um, both of these tools you probably aren't likely to encounter until you're in the career type job. And just having experience with them ahead of time may give you some uh, a little bit of an advantage. Um, and then we're gonna go over a whole list of essential skills and behaviors that you can use to help um, populate that SWOT analysis. 
And so if you go over to, like I said, the handouts and download the four page sheet there, um, the first page you'll see here, it's, it's written into three simple steps. One is to set up your SWOT matrix. So SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And as a business tool, um, senior leaders are using this to identify the strengths of their company, their organization, and the weaknesses of their companies and organizations. And you can see how this might be <clears throat> a tool that they can use for their um, their situ situational awareness so that they can make plans to um, leverage those strengths, um, reduce their weaknesses, eliminate them. Um, this helps them build a strategy. So what we want to do for you is build a personal development strategy. So one way you can you can do your development is to just say, I want to learn about X and then read books on that thing. So that's focusing on your interests. There's nothing really wrong with that. But you may be avoiding your weaknesses and some opportunities because they just don't fall into the interesting category. And this may set you up for a little bit of a failure or a shock when you do get a job and you haven't really prepared for a specific area that they're going to expect you to know. Um, time management, for instance, that's not something that probably people will go and just pick up a book on, but it's often an area that people need to improve. And as it, before you're employed, you know, you're your time manager. But when you get hired for somewhere, someone else is holding you accountable for your time. And if you have no idea how to manage your time, you could find yourself in a lot of uh, hot water really fast. So what the SWAT does is help you strategically look at what you're good at, what you might need help with, and then make a plan to fill any holes that you have in your um, foundation. So a strength is something like public speaking, something that you're really good at, uh, could be writing, communication, um, field skills. Maybe you just can lift a lot of heavy things, you can drive a boat really well, you can do, um, you already know how to use a GPS and GIS and maybe mapping. So that could be something that you have as a strength. And then a weakness could be this, those exact same things. If the jobs that you're looking for require that you need GIS and that's a weakness, you could put that there. If uh, we, public speaking is really hard for you, then put that in a weakness. Um, and then you'll see usually a SWAT is set up into four quadrants with just strengths, weakness, opportunities and threats. But I don't find that to be very helpful because that's just a list. So we have on the right hand side here potential actions. This is where the strategy comes in. So I list on the, the one side all of my um, things, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The other side of it is where I get my potential actions. If I have an opportunity, so that means there's a, a conference with a free student um, registration coming to my area, that's an opportunity. And then how can I leverage it? I can sign up and go. And um, that's how we turn that into an actual strategy. So. Here's a list that I put together between some of the ideas that I came up with and that Leslie had um, had discussed with me and and put together this little sheet just to say, here are some things to think about. Because, again, too, if you're just making a list of strengths, but don't have a list in front of you, you might just be missing some obvious things because we only know what we know. So. Um, some of these things are time management, like I said, and this to me, essential behaviors and skills are the things that when you get hired, I don't care if it's your first job or your last job <laughs> or a temporary job. These are things that are expected of you at some level. And so if you don't think that you're very good at. So let's say reliability, right? Are you reliable? Do you show up on time? Do you schedule reschedule a lot? Some people don't really realize that they're not reliable. Ask your friends if they think that you're a reliable person. And if you're not, figure out how you can become a reliable person because your employers expect you to be. Um, all the way down through being customer service oriented. Now, don't wait for your, your employer to sign you up for customer service training. If you don't have not ever had a job where you dealt with people and customers, figure it out, find some training. Um, or like I said, read a book and then in the boxes underneath, there's some more specialized skills. If you're not planning to apply for a job where there's um, field operations, then this wouldn't go on your SWOT analysis. But if you are planning to move up into leadership, then these are the things you might want to have in your longer term strategy. And then technical skills. This is a special set for me. I always, when I'm coaching, tell people that it's important that you have something that sets you apart. If you only have the essential behaviors and skills, you're basically 
at the bottom level with everyone else. But then if another person comes in and they have got awesome GIS skills, um, maybe they're really good at presentations, when that opportunity arises, they're gonna get picked before you get picked. So um, if you're passionate about any of those things on there, and again, these lists are not exhaustive. Obviously there's a million other things that could be on that technical skills list. These are just some very common ones in the environmental field. Um, you, then you have a way to raise your hand. I can do that um, when maybe other people can't. Yeah, and Laura, maybe I can add for a second there too, just based on a couple of things you were saying too. I was going to just emphasize the point you made about this is a tool for you. So you got to be honest with yourself. Right. <laughs> yes. So that's just, it's just something, but it's only for you. You don't have to share this with anybody. Um, and then this is also another um, one of the, the keys in the, this, the professional world is being able to take feedback. And it's hard. You got to learn how to do this. But it's it's such an easy gimme on this because um, whenever you get feedback, if you learn how to take that constructively, this is exactly what you want to put down there. And it, even if it's something that you completely disagree with what they said, what, I'm, I'm great at high management. This was just a bad project because it did Keep it on there and work towards it and then refer back to it. Um, don't just ask your friends. Ask the people who <laughs> are not, you know, might not know. Yeah. So there was <laughs> maybe the objective um, piece. And then, um, and then I was just going to say to keep it a living document. Even on those days where you just feel like you're rocking it, those are the days you also want to add this and just make sure that, you know, this is something you maintain. Absolutely. I love this tool. Yeah, keep an eye out for things that you really enjoy. Like, what are those things, like I said, that you could make yourself really stand out in? Um, and then if there's things that you just really hate, you know, what do you want to avoid? One of yeah. the tactics is avoidance. So what type of job would you avoid those things? If the idea of these field skills just, ugh, well, then let's just find a way not to apply for a job that has those things. <laughs> that, that too is good information, right? <laughs> um, okay, thank you for that. And then so the last thing what you're going to do is take all of those tactics that you created in the SWOT analysis and then not just that. So that's one avenue to get things onto this personal development plan. Other ways are like if you are already employed and you have someone awesome like Leslie working with you, um, you can ask um, or have someone review it. Uh, you need a, an accountability partner. Like she said, you can keep this to yourself. You don't have to share all of your, your SWAT with someone else. You don't have to share your deepest, darkest secrets and weaknesses to other people if you don't want to. Um, but that doesn't have to be the only source to get information on your personal development plan. And if you do have a resource like a Leslie or a mentor or a coach who can review this with you, that's that's a really good way to, to have someone ask you good questions about it. You know, why did you put this on here? What other ways can you um, take advantage of this? And 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 OK, you said you were going to do this by September 16th. Are you signed up yet? Let somebody know that you're planning to do these things. Um, but this whole sheet here is about turning it into uh, also from your SWOT analysis, just a list into a SMART goal. So um, on the, I don't want to get into it too much, but on the handout, you see that the SMART goals are making it measurable, attainable, um, relevant to you. So, again, this is not someone else's goals. These are your goals. And um, time reference, that's a big thing. A lot of people, you know, with um, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> uh, New Year's resolutions and things. Um, they make a plan. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to uh, read this book. I'm going to do what I know I did for myself. I'm going to read 10 books in 10 weeks. And then, you know, it never happens. But you didn't write it down. You got to write it down and you have to um, come back, circle around and see if you actually did it. So that is the handout. If you have any questions about it, you can always um, send an email or connect on LinkedIn. And I just wanted to provide a few more things. So tactics that you can do, they don't have to be huge. Um, they can just be read a book. They can be take a course. So I wanted to point out. Um, so this book, 10 Things Employers Want You to Learn in College, I haven't read it, but I just met with an instructor from the pulp and paper um, program at SUNY ESF over here in Syracuse. And this is a book that he recommends. Um, Emotional Agility, I'm currently reading. It's very good. So a lot of times starting a new job, any job, um, controlling your thoughts, actions, staying positive. I think it's a great book resource to have when you're seeking a job because the, the over, over whatever use <laughs> of rejections that you're going to get, um, may get, it can really uh, damage your ego. Um, 
And then Silent Spring, this is one of the books that has really, it's an older book, but it's how a lot of people have gotten very passionate about conservation and the environment. So if you need something to fuel that information, um, if you're looking for conservation jobs, it's a good one to read. Um, and then there's a couple of different resources online. Udemy and Coursera offer really quick installments of courses. They can be over weeks or, or, or um, I think it's mostly weeks or hours, but they have little bite-sized uh, units. And then sometimes they have assessments with them, but you can take those for cheap or for free. I think Udemy does them for like $14.99 and Coursera has, I think they're like however much the course costs, but if you want to audit it and don't get an actual certification for taking it, they'll let you do it for free. So um, those are really valuable resources. And one of them, I think it's Coursera, actually does courses online with Esri, so you can take free GIS classes too. Um, and then two online resources that I recommend are the Muse. The Muse is actually a career source and they have lots of great articles and backlogs of articles and information on job search. And then Mind Tools. Mind Tools is more professional. So it has things about personal development plans, um, problem solving tools, all kinds of information um, in that in that area. So I highly recommend that one. So we've gotten to the point in the webinar, we're going to do an interview with Leslie. And um, so I'm gonna go to another screen here and just go ahead with the questions. Leslie, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> um, can you just describe what your role is with HDR a little bit more? Yeah, so kind of building off of what I um, said at the beginning, I, I manage a team of about 60 plus or minus um, environmental team members. Um, that includes, that goes beyond to include a heavy level of collaboration with the non-environmental team. There's a lot of education, as you can all probably imagine with that on uh, the value of environmental and how we can build into some of our programs and then also um, optimizing what we can do within our organization. HDR is an engineering firm. Um, and this is kind of a common thing in the industry where you're when you are looking for companies on what type of company you want to work for or agency, et cetera. When environmental is not um, the end all be all of it all, then you need to campaign for that basically on a regular basis. So that's kind of the organization we're in, but there's a really nice collaboration that goes with this and uh, takes, you know, that's part of my job is to make sure that um, there is that dialogue happening. Um, we do have a, a broad range of uh, environmental staff. So there's a lot of um, focus on team developments. I, I try not to use the word staff. Um, I like to use the word team member, but whether we're talking to a manager or a team member, um, within there, everybody needs to play a part in that. So there's a lot of interaction around how can we best develop and raise up and promote our team. And then around that, how do we smartly grow our team with either new hires, acquisitions, other types of business strategy? How can we make the most of it with all those factors built in? I'm also a senior project manager. So technically, I, I still manage uh, projects with uh, NEPA. Um, the state equivalent for California is called CEQA. So that's the uh, same type of thing, another regulatory so or doing otherwise uh, environmental strategy on larger programs. Um, that's what I kind of spend my technical time on. Um, and then just a lot of recruiting, a lot of business development. So I, I tend to like wearing a lot of hats um, and kind of keeping those plates spinning and then having a larger team that um, can, can play a more focused role in some of those as well. So um, ultimately, on a really regular basis, um, daily, many times, we're dealing with um, this kind of um, discussion that we're having today. And, and like I was saying before, I think is really exciting about Laura's group is, is those of you who have taken um, your careers into your hands that can really try to stand out, drive your own career. That is bar none, the, um, the key. If you drive it, it's not, nobody else is going to do it for you. You might get a handout once or twice in your career and it'll be a one-time deal. So you driving your career is really the way to go. So, absolutely. Okay. That's what I always say. <laughs> yeah. Um, my next question was, uh, what have been the, the skills and behaviors that have helped you advance in your career? But maybe you could combine that with a little bit of your history with HDR, like 
did you, you didn't start where you're at, so. No, I actually, I've only been with this company for a little over a year. I think um, I was thinking back as we were planning for this on kind of what the, what happened? <laughs> so speak. Well, first of all, I think I've, I've, I've um, worn a lot of hats, I, as I tend to call it, or I, I've played a lot of different types of roles and some of them, you know, I've done better in some than others. You know, for instance, your example before about the field work, I, I did have a stint there and on doing uh, field work early in my career. And I am just really not great at that. Um, it's not a comfort, <laughs> comfortable area. I'm so pleased that I did it, though, because I can have a better conversation with it today. And I highly respect my field teams um, to be able to kind of orchestrate the right way to go about those field efforts and, and meet the goals and communicate it through. I mean, it's extremely challenging. It takes um, uh, a very smart person to uh, do the field effort. So I think what happened for me was, um, depending on whatever the situation was, I I, um, I I jumped out of my comfort zone. You know, there was a need somewhere and I decided to fill it. Um, and, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's requested or some, sometimes it's something that you recognize. So in, in my case, um, you know, on a couple different occasions, every single time I've jumped out of my comfort zone, something came of it. Um, typically positive. <laughs> and, but, you know, you make of it what, what you will. So I remember there was one, um, one place where I worked before where we were working on some pretty um, high profile, huge projects, but they were going to sunset at some point. We we're going to finish those projects and still relatively early in my career. Um, I asked the question, what should I go out and talk to some of our other prospective clients, see what else is going on out there? And that kind of question, if I get that, I swoon. I'm just, oh, my God, I love this person. I cannot believe they're going to go. Yeah, do it. And I was given full support, of course, asking questions along the way. But um, that within the next year, year and a half, I was I was um, our business development manager in that region, you know, which is so, so many of these things are made up firms at that point. You know, but and then you develop it from there. And ultimately, I absolutely love business development. Same thing comes when you start working with broader teams that you weren't working with technically um, in these types of things. So that's I don't think that there's ever been a back step since that point um, where I kind of grew that into. I kind of play more of a strategic role at this point. Um, so, yeah. I think a, a few tips that I think I was given along the way that I that really um, held true to me was uh, one that I brought up a little bit before. Uh, learn how to take feedback, learn the value, appreciate it. This is it can be hard if you just take it at face value. If this is just a constructive criticism coming my way or whatever it is. But if you actually take that as the freebie that you're taking to develop your own career, put it on your SWOT analysis. Um, that's that's bar none and then refer back to it that is that is the number one um um freebie that you can communicate um how you're growing with with a you know real intention um seeking out working with as many managers on as many projects regions gain diversity in your career um at some point you'll need to focus um at some level and work that out for yourself on when and where that is but even if you come in and you're working with an agency that does this thing, try to develop some sort of diversity in that. We're definitely working with more people, as many people as possible, just so you can um, flex with their styles and learn how things are done well and not well. You know, you pick up all of this, but learn, g gain some diversity in your own experience. And then um, the third thing I'll put out there is whenever you come across, you will come across those projects, those project managers, those clients who are just not great. <laughs> They're extremely challenging. Take that as an opportunity for yourself. This, those are the ones that are going to make you better. It's not the easy projects. It's not the fun projects that are great. Um, it's the ones that uh, really make you stretch, you know, and, and, and they're hard. <laughs> it's, it, but if you think it's a lot easier to take those if you're thinking about them from the standpoint of they're helping you carry it forward. So take those as a value and then find a friend to get through. <laughs> so, it's always good to have a safe person to vent to. Just be careful who you're yeah. venting to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and don't vent to everyone. Oh, gosh. Right. We're talk about behaviors. There's the one. No negativity. Don't be the Debbie Downer in the office. Oh, my gosh. Nobody likes that person. Even if you think everyone else around you is doing it. So it's OK. Don't do it. 
So really, really, really good, really good point. point. <laughs> Avoid yeah. the Debbie Downer click. That's my, that's the big takeaway. <laughs> but you said a lot of really good stuff there. Um, I think that when you talk about working on a project or even having a job that you don't love at first, or, you know, whether you move around within the company or to a different company, it's all learning. So you did field work and found out you didn't like it. That's actually what I did with volunteering before I, while I was still in college and before I started working, I thought I wanted to be um, like a wildlife officer. I'm going to go work in a park. And then, you know, in Florida, a, um, a forestry person is not quite the same as one in Utah. <laughs> and, oh. um, so I volunteered and I did that and I realized, Oh, this is not, no, I don't want to do this at all. Um, and so, but some people love it. So it's, and it doesn't, you can't put your values and your passions on other people as well. I don't judge other people for wanting to do that job. It's a, it's, it's a hard job, but it isn't the right job for me. Um, but, I, but like you said, I'm really glad that I did it because now I know, and I've learned it. I know what it is, um, what it entails. And I appreciate the people who do do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then what you said about jumping out of your comfort zone, that's, that's the same as what they talk about in uh, working out. You know, you can't build muscles without no, no pain, no gain. <laughs> you, have, you have to stretch. You have to go beyond what you think you can do to, to test your limits. Um, you just have to be careful not to test them so far that you break something, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it is um, important. Nice to and then um, I think when you're talking about the diversity and getting involved in different projects and things, again, too, it's all just for learning. And then you don't know what you don't know. So you might end up working on a project and go, oh, my gosh, this is the best. I mean, that when I was in college and I thought I was going to be working in forestry, um, I took my class in uh, wetlands management and ecology was the like, oh, my God, that's what I want to do. And then I tried to get wetlands jobs. And then I realized that. Oh, all they do is regulations. I don't want that job. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you just you don't know till you know, and you have to keep working through it and keep trying. And um, that's where researching and learning all of this stuff can really help you figure that out before you're doing it on your paycheck time or someone else's time. Yeah, yeah so, you know, what I thought was a, a big eureka moment for me too. Well, I'm getting something back. Um, what I thought was a eureka moment for me just the last you know five years or so was. Um, to the point that, you know, how you don't like certain things that, of course, somebody else will like doing that well in delineation. But the stuff that you really like doing, other people really don't like it. I mean, <laughs> so not everyone's good at the things you're really good at, too. And, you know, sometimes you think, well, this is just comes easily to me. So I think it's easy. I really want to stretch myself because this is too easy. But in reality, it's 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 kind of one of those confidence moments. You're like, oh, wait, not everybody likes numbers, you know, like or not everybody gets the, you know, the bigger picture strategy of this. And that just comes now, you know, so that's then, you know, you clicked it, you found it. For sure. <laughs> not everybody would have enjoyed putting together this SWOT analysis personal development handout, but I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, tell us what is the most common skill gap you see amongst the new hires? Um. I think communication, you were kind of speaking to this before um, a little bit. I think communication is one where you can study in, in college, um, you know, all day long. You can read books, but um, until you come into the industry and, and learn the communication style that works for that industry, um, it's, it's always going to be something you need to develop. Um, two things on that. I think reading books, like some of the ones that you recommended or, or attending some of the um, professional organizations, it can improve your um, your communication style and how you portray your point. So I think that's a really good tool, like a kind of, um, I don't know, you can kind of flex your ability to communicate certain topics on those. The other thing is, um, I, I think you should come into every, whether it's a new job, you're right out of college, or if you're just transitioning, or you're just taking on a new role within your organization, um, take that entire period as for the first year recognize that you're still learning in, into that role. And it might not even feel like it takes a whole year. It does. So just give yourself the cycle. And if you're if you're riding Easy Street the last six months because you found it, keep asking yourself uh, the question. But I think communication is the number one um, skill that needs to be developed regardless. It's not because you're not a great communicator. You just still need to learn it for the industry. Writing with on the same topic 
writing is part of communication and being a really effective writer to communicate your point or the technical topic or whatever it is, it varies from college to coming into the, um, you know, the industry or depending on the type of technical document you're putting together or just to, to communicate between your organization on, um, on what you're trying to influence or persuade. So uh, writing skills are critical. Number one thing, if you're a good writer, you're going to get farther faster. And if you're not, develop it, make best friends with your technical editor and use your technical editor. Um, you know, so writing is just number, just right up there. And then um, attitude and professionalism. I think that people can really kind of muddy up um, being confident versus um, being entitled. And so I think that um, just coming in with a, a cer certain sense of confidence, but with humility so that you're able to flex with this. I think that's um all three. I, I didn't say one. I, I, I gave you three, I know, but I think those are probably <laughs> the number one, two, three <laughs> that you can um, come in and really set yourself apart from the others. I totally agree. Um, the communication is hard, though, because a lot of it, um, I mean, written style, writing, um, there's the technical aspect of that, but especially verbal communication and reading people and responding because um, it's tied to emotional intelligence. Um, and being professional, um, you know, and but some of it is just learned. So it's hard to just come in and say, oh, I'm a great at communication. But almost some of it you just always have to learn, you know, you, like um, some of it, though, is best practices. Like like we just talked about. Don't ever badmouth people. I get people who send me the most absurd venting through an email written. That's documentation that people who are in the in-between server room and the IT can read. Don't do that. <laughs> but that's things that some people don't even know. Um, so when people try to engage me with negativity in an email, I, I, you know, put the kibosh on that. Like, we're not going to go down that road. But that's something that if you don't know, you can get very easily pulled into something down the road um, with that. Um, it could be embarrassing. Yeah. The yeah, way you're called out is likely to be embarrassing. So that's a good point. Pick yeah. Up the phone if you want to vent or if certainly if there's um, if you have a problem with somebody or, you, you know, you interpret something negatively, pick up the phone. It's, it, it, it's challenging to have that hard conversation, but it will not embarrass you later if you uh, if that email gets shared. Right. It's definitely better. Always try to take the high road. Try not to say or write anything negative about, especially about a person. Don't ever do that. Um, and then what did you say? Confidence, not entitlement. Entitlement. Yeah. I think that's a yeah. big one with millennials. Um, a lot of people starting new jobs, and I don't know if you see this, but I've heard this and I've seen it myself um, coming into a job and saying, I deserve this, thinking they're going to get automatic promotions, thinking that. Oh, he got this. So I get this. Um, you know, there's there's always that fair versus equal. Um, they're not the same thing. <laughs> and um, have you have you seen that with more? Yeah, band? but you know what? I would also add to this. I always get a little bit annoyed with the millennials. And I've definitely seen it with millennials. Don't get me wrong, but I've seen it with with mid-level folks and senior level folks just as much. And what I what I think the saddest part is, at least if there's somebody who's who's coming in from college who has this, they can calibrate pretty easily without any kind of faltering. What I find the saddest thing is when you find someone who's you know 10, 15 years in, and they're noticing that person who, let's say, um, who might be getting, you know, recognized more. And that person has invested in their early years and they've done this kind of career coaching or they've been active in their professional organizations or they've taken those extra classes, whatever it is. And they're being recognized because they see the bigger picture or they're communicating it more effectively or they're thinking of the team versus the me, the we versus the me. And I think that that is something where you be that person who took the bull by the horns is the person who's only figuring out that um, lesson later in their career um, that uh, it's just so sad because, you know, they can they can pick it up at any time. Everybody. This is this is effective uh, guidance for everybody. But and then you go to the senior and there's all, already that um, kind of the idea of like, well, they're not going to change now, <laughs> you know, because it's harder. Like, oh, gosh, I've made it this far. I should be entitled towards 
it's not that way, especially in this industry, because there's a lot that's being more automated or there's there's uh, there's rate um, restrictions on certain jobs or there's just there's things that you're you're meeting. the. Per- I want to work with someone who has that attitude. You you relayed before that professionalism. I know I can work with more than somebody who is going to charge more for less effectiveness. So, you know, there, the challenge is going to go at all levels. Right. And I think that's exactly the, the fair versus equal thing. Um, some people think I worked here 10, 10 years. They've only been here two. So I deserve more. But yeah, that doesn't go anywhere. Doesn't yeah. work that way. Um, and let's see. I think that um, lead, lead us to our next question. Um, what kind of training can a new hire expect to receive or should they expect to receive any at all? Um. I think I think there's a lot of trainings based on the specific company or agency on on the you know a lot of safety things and just procedures and such. There's you'll, you'll probably drown in a lot of that. I think the um, I think if you're asking for I think it's worth um, initiating and asking for trainings that's related to your technical field, um, emphasizing the fact that you need continuing education and if you do if you have a certification or otherwise, but that's worthy of laying out at the beginning. Of, I include that actually in my negotiations up front to make sure that you get that type of support. Um, writing courses and specifically if there's certain clients or um, types of projects that you'll be um, <laughs> writing for, you know, <laughs> um, you know, ask for those types of things. Um, don't assume that they're going to um, guess for you, especially if they're not, you know, the scenario I gave before, if they're not an environmental firm. Um, ask for these types. And, and to be honest, it's going to be a, a it'll, it'll be portrayed well on you to um, know what what you need to get ahead and then ask questions otherwise around it. I think you mentioned when I had first shown you the, um, the SWAT into the development plan thing. Um, you had mentioned if a employee team member had come to you with that, you'd be like, wow. <laughs> So, oh, yeah, if you came with the SWAT, I mean, whether or not you share it with me or not, and that's, I didn't mean don't share just to your comfort level uh, of that, but yeah, I mean, bar none, <laughs> that was, that would show me that I, you're coming to me asking for um, something specific to fill in gaps, to give feedback on something that you've already assessed. It shows me that you're welcome, you're um, open to feedback, and then that you're planning to do something with it. And I was, I actually had a conversation like that last month with somebody and they didn't come with the SWAT. I'm going to, I'm going to bring it up to her actually, uh, <laughs> because I really like your uh, tool. But she came to me with that kind of enthusiasm and her plans and her goals and such. Um, and I actually, at the end, I was just saying, I would really love to go along with you on this. I use, you know, let's talk. I'd love to hear how you're doing in a few months. And, and then just let me know if there's anything I can do or connect you with people, et cetera, as a result. Because it, it's, I, I, I know she's driving it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's great. Like, I think some people um, may approach something like that as like, oh, this is all the stuff I have to learn. But I, I feel I have my own for me and my business. So I have both a business and personal SWATs and development plans. And I'm excited about them when I'm like, yeah. okay, I'm going to do this training. I'm going to learn this thing. I'm very excited about it. And I can't wait to cross it off the list. So I think um, that too is the, you know, the way to be positive and stay you should be enthusiastic about it. It I mean, yeah, you're you're here, but you're gonna get to hear it. That's really exciting to me. I think I think so too. I think that's great. And you know, I think you're a great example too of somebody who's um I mean, it's you, you kind of forget the fact that people are are doing this at all different levels. So, you know, you might be coming into a job and here's your, you know, your goals and, and you're trying to figure out how to get ahead. The person who's 10, 15, 20, 50, you know, hopefully not 50 years, hopefully there's retirement somewhere. <laughs> they set goals too, and they're they're developing these, and they've been where you've been. So asking those questions and being part of that, recognizing that they have been through this and have recognized the value of this, that's that's a safe ground. Um, so that's, you know, and knowing, understanding, or building into your goals um, what their goals are, you know, for instance, um, I'm looking to see how I can get ahead in this position. I want to manage projects. And so I'm going to go talk to my supervisor who's been managing projects for, for a time. What does he or she want to do is her, his or her goals are going to rely on the effectiveness of me knowing how to properly manage projects 
you know, so you want to make sure that it's aligning and that's a, a effective way of communicating so that you can get their investment and help you get to the point that they can move up them. It's all succession planning. So Exactly. And I think that's the, um, when we talk about the SWOT analysis and how you can put ideas on there from anywhere, not just the list of those skills that, that we shared, but if you are working and your company has values and they have goal, what are the goals for your company and how can you add that to your SWOT analysis to figure out what you should be doing? If you see yourself with a future with that company, your goal should be at least to some extent aligning with theirs. Yeah, really good. Point. And then um, the other thing that you touched on about if you've been working, at, you know, you're 20 years in, 30 years in, I think, and from my previous hiring, uh, being on the hiring side and also from coaching, I think what happens is a lot of people get cushy and cozy in their jobs and then they don't continue to revisit a SWOT analysis or their plans. And then that's when you get side uh, sideswiped and you're you lose your job for economic reasons, for whatever reasons, downsizing. Um, and then you haven't been re upping your value. So people get a lot of I don't get hired because I'm too old. It isn't that you haven't re upped your value. <laughs> so yeah. um, I think that uh, what you said earlier about keeping the SWOT as, and, the, and the development plan as a living document. For me, I'm a lister, so I want to keep it forever because I want to see all the things I crossed off. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I did this training. Oh, I did this. And I've, I, you know, I have this huge list of things that I've learned. Um, I kind of wish I had that from the start, right? Then we'd be more confident if we had this like, oh, my God, I know all this stuff. Um, <laughs> I think that's a great idea. So all of you younger persons out there, start your plan and keep it forever. <laughs> um, okay, here's a question that that I really like, because I think I learned some of this, um, for better or worse, um, on my own. <laughs> um, how can new hires let higher ups know that they want opportunities to advance without coming off as aggressive? I really like this question. <laughs> I'm thinking, I hate it. <laughs> I really like this question. Um, I think that's a fine line. So I think that people should think about this. Um, so um, <laughs> I have I have uh, images of people in my head right now. Sorry. So I was um, <laughs> thinking about how to uh, kind of come across this so that you don't what, what you might think is tenacity could come off as completely disrespectful. Um, and, 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 you know, everybody wants to help you. Not everybody, you know, the, the, the Pollyanna of it is that everybody wants to help you. You're doing well actually helps the company, helps your manager. So in general, people want you to succeed, but um, you need to understand that balance. So I would say, first off, whoever your higher ups, um, Always respect their time. Be clear about what you want to meet about. Um, set a meeting, put something on the calendar. Or otherwise, at least ask them if they have 15 minutes. Keep it short initially and, and be clear about what you want to talk about. And, and don't go into that meeting saying, I'm, I want this. I'm not leaving until we get this. You know, be flexible with it. So start with that. Um, keep the attitude positive, like Laura was saying, you were saying before. <laughs> um, keep it positive and go in there with, interest but also questions looking for feedback on how you should proceed on getting to whatever goal you're going towards with that one it's okay not to have the answer it's okay to go in and say that i'm just interested in and in growing within this organization or to getting to this or i like what i saw with this manager I, I think i'd like to emulate him or her um you know things like that i'd, I'd like to just kind of start talking about this and seeing how we can get there um, but be open to feedback and, and recognize the fact that you really might not get um, the yes at, at, you know, day one. So be open to that. Um, but that's OK. So go in there with with your objective is more to frame out your plan to get there. So then you don't walk off. If, if you go in there trying to drive the conversation, um, you, you very well you're very likely to be unsuccessful and, and disappointed in the end. Um, go with options. Do your research ahead of time. Um, go with options. And then uh, in your point before about look at your company's strategic plan, see how this fits into the bigger picture. Um, 
go in there with what your understanding is and then ask for feedback on how that should be adjusted because that can help your conversation with the next person or with the same person. But you should always, whenever you do follow up, tie it back and make it make it very clear that you've been listening. You want to make the best use of their time. And if there is ever an option to actually make that person look good in the end because you're their you know, succession planning or you can take something off their their plate or somebody else's, um, that's always a good way of taking it to the team mentality. So um, that's how think about um, thinking bigger than yourself, uh, thinking on, about that we mentality and versus the me. Um, so going in and, and, and having that positive attitude, bringing solutions, always having that reputation of always jumping in with both feet and then doing all of this with high quality. It doesn't sound as, it's not as exhausting as it sounds. This is something that if that's just your your character and your recognizes that, then um, everyone will be on your side to help push you forward with that. Yep, so, I think the we versus me is, is a good way to frame it, think about it. And then, um, you know, if your if your goals or what you're trying to get after just don't align with the company or that or agency, I know it's different in private versus government too. A lot of times you get you hit walls in government when um, there isn't money for training or there's the what I what I saw way too often and always drove me crazy. Um, and thinking about this question for myself is uh, the bureaucracy and the the perceived. Um, the way the agency is perceived when they give things to people. So, um, and that, you mm -hmm. and the, the equality versus fairness. Um, we did, we couldn't let so-and-so take a training. So you didn't get, you can't take a training either. If we give you the training, we have to give everyone the training. So when you hit those kind of walls, there's not often a way around them. And if you keep pushing for them, you're going to come off as aggressive. Um, that might be when you just kind of rethink whether you're in the right place or not which I wish I had done a lot sooner. <laughs> um, but I think in your situation where you have a public entity and a broad thinking, and if and I think you have explained this well on how to approach it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's also, so your scenario that's concerned, not that this is going to work, because there's that's a really challenging scenario, but then you bring it to the we of it, say, you know, there's groups like NAP. I'm just saying this because I, you know, this yeah. is one that I know better than others, but um, who, if they can provide that kind of training and bring it to the whole group, um, you know, for the same charge, and that's something, or, or certain consultants will do trainings for you and stuff like that. If it's something that you can provide some feedback into um, how this um, improves the way, the process of how it's done or the quality or the effectiveness of your time, et cetera, then that um, brings it into that uh, larger business um, strategy of it on on why this is a good use of that agency or that company's dollars. Also, time it with the um, the fiscal budgeting cycle. <laughs> There's a strategic line, even if it's yeah. not for another <laughs> year. But if you're aware of that and many communicated as such, that's pretty impressive. To, uh, yeah, that yeah. The fact yeah. that you know, if it doesn't um, work this year, maybe next year. Yeah. Um, I saw. I just watched a webinar too yesterday on. Um, how to present GIS to your executives. Um, that's another area where people can be really excited and then feel really um, held back when their executives don't understand the power of GIS. And then so um, there's a common theme with that where um, some GIS people are pretty demotivated because the hard work that they want to do and the great ideas they have and the opportunities for innovations for them to create um, are are being dismissed or um, not being accepted. So some of the things that they suggested were like um, bringing them examples, bringing them case studies. Um, so not just like, hey, I want to do this, but here's why and here's how I, you know, making your case, why I think yeah. this would fit the we, all of us. And I wish I could remember the name of that company so I could give them proper credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really um, good topic, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, so how are all the skills and behaviors that we've discussed, how do they relate to performance ratings and reviews? And I know that uh, you may be speaking specifically to HDR, but. I don't think so. I think um, I, th I think something I hear a lot um, just across the energy there's, uh, in industry, there's a lot of different ways to do reviews. Companies do it. Agencies do it all differently. Some don't do it at all or some are just purely by, um, you know, 
time that they have available. So, you know, it, it kind of spans. Um, the other piece of it that I think is really critical is that uh, it often relies on the, um, the skills of the manager. So the supervisor or whoever's um, giving that uh, review. And some of them just aren't very comfortable doing these types of reviews. And unfortunately, that's not always very well managed or developed for managers. Um, but that's all outside of your control. So that's that kind of brings us all together as far as um, kind of how you can approach this one. Um, so I think first off, initiate your own reviews. Do your annual reviews, do what's needed. If you have those, you'll at least be prepared for that because you will have already um, sought feedback, both from your colleagues, your friends, but also those that, you know, any managers you're working on. And you can kind of come up with your own things or you can model it off of if, if you, your company or agency does have a, a formal process that so you can kind of follow that. But ultimately what you're looking at, you could use it, you, you could model it off the SWOT analysis. That's a great way of doing it so that you're able to apply it directly to your goal setting. Um, and then go in and say, you know, be completely open for some feedback. What this also does is if you are having, if you do have annual reviews, this can take the surprise out of it so you can address beforehand. So at the end of the day, it'll all be positive. So I think um, the main thing you can do is to initiate your own reviews and just, it's, it's uncomfortable at first, but then you get used to it. Um, and also don't be that, you know, eager go-getter person who just like, Tell me more. I really only want compliments. Don't be that person. Look for the look for the person. Uh, it's it's so annoying to be the person who's like, oh God, they need another pat on the back. But no, rather be the person who's you know truly trying to frame out and and improve on a daily basis, kind of or you know whatever on a um, constant improvement type of model. Um, also learn how to give feedback. So um, the the worst thing is when you have someone who's a, worried about the person being reviewed, recognizing who's giving the reviews so that they don't want to give negative feedback. But if you're able to effectively give really useful feedback, you know, how can they do better on this project or this technical area or just, you know, and, and know how that fits in with this bigger picture thinking, then I think that's something that re really can be recognized um, for you as a leader. That's a leadership quality beyond just a colleague quality. Um, and then when you do get feedback, Keep referring back to that. Keep build it into your communication for the following years or with conversations with some of these reviewers. Say, here's what I heard. Here's how I've addressed it. I'd like to make sure that, you know, I'm I'm developing. You know, this is something that I take very seriously. And I'd like, to, I'm not looking for compliments. By the way, side point here, I'd say going into the in environmental industry, Lori, you said something about this earlier. Um, you'll get you you might get more negatives or rejections than not it can get really um um it, it can wear you down sometimes <laughs> in the same in the same model um if you're if you're constantly seeking compliments you're likely to be disappointed and it's really exhausting it makes me think as a manager that um that's what's motivating you more than actually doing good work so just within yourself find something else to drive you and just certainly seek Seek out and enjoy and share those successes. So don't, you know, don't dodge them, but um, motivate your, find a way to motivate yourself and, and build energy in another way. And just don't constantly ask for compliments. But it'll be good. <laughs> you'll get more, honestly, if you have that positive attitude and, and you're part of the team and you're brought on to more teams and you'll, you're getting those promotions. That's a compliment without, you know, um, by all means. Right. I think uh, too. Um, I had a manager who would just say, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I need more than that. Like, thanks. I am going to keep doing what I'm doing. What else can I do? <laughs> so yeah. I, I would say not everyone's good at it. Right. It's, it's not really because they're a manager means that they're great. And, and to say, great. Not nah, that was that was you let me off the hook with that one pretty easy. But I think it's in your best interest to especially if you if you have the relationship with your supervisor or a person who's giving you the feedback to say, okay, I will keep doing that. What else can I do? Like, tell me one thing, something, you know, um, to put the effort to do that. <laughs> um, so we only have a couple minutes left and there is one question here. So okay. I think we'll jump off of our questions. Um, the question from the audience is how important is it to get an EI certification? Um, are you familiar with that? It's for an engineering um, 
um, and training. Is that like a, is that accurate? Uh, Pratika, can you tell us what the EI is specifically? Um, while she's doing that, um, can you just talk about certifications in general? Do you think that? Yeah, how important they are. Yeah, that's a kind of a common one on our side of the industry, too, where, um, you know, we don't have, for instance, on the engineering side guides, it's pretty critical. Uh, or on the geology side, it's pretty critical for you to get these registrations and um, credentials. Uh, we do have a, um, some that are recognized uh, more or less at different sides. I still think they're useful so long as you use them. Um, if they're, you know, sometimes they're not always brought up in um, RFPs and uh, requests for information or requests for proposals and things like that, uh, but it typically does lend towards, uh, you know, somebody who's already been vetted in the industry, so it, it can't hurt, but there's a lot of kind of throwaway certifications as well. So honestly, I don't have a a, a big feeling one way or another <laughs> on it. Um, I think that um, so long as you use it, um, same thing with uh, participation in professional organizations, be active and do something with it. Otherwise, what's the point? But um, but for, yeah, if, if she's uh, uh, speaking to the engineering certification, I think it's, um, which I think that's EIT. But um, anyway, I think it's pretty important. I think um, I agree. I know when I worked in my agency, anybody who was a professional anything, they may not have needed that right at the beginning, but they were typically required to have it to reach a certain level. And I can tell you what that level is. Um, but whether it was a professional wetland scientist or geologist engineer, um, the certifications at some point are important. Um, I have my project management certification and I adore having it. So <laughs> I think well, I, you know, really good point, though. it's kind of worth figuring out what you want to do first. So, you know, it's right. no point having a PWS if you're not actually going to be a wetland scientist. In exactly. the end. But there's a lot of money that goes into it. So you don't really want to invest in that one. Right, you want right. to do there's a lot of people who have PMPs because at some point somebody told them to do it and they had a lot of time on their hands because that's a pretty rigorous one. But if you're not actually going to be a program manager, um, it doesn't serve a lot of purpose and you know you really at least make sure you're a really good project right project manager. Yeah. yeah so i think that's a, that's a definitely a good point um depending both whether it's a requirement of your position and whether it's something you plan to continue to do um even not in this field my boyfriend is a teacher and um you know he had a lot of pressure to get a teaching certification right at the beginning and I was like, if you're not going to keep teaching for a couple of years, don't bother. <laughs> you know, yeah. let's make sure there's a lot of time and money that goes into that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I hope that answered your questions. Do you have any, if there are any other questions, put them in the Q&A now. Um, we're going to go back to the slides really quick and Leslie's going to wrap it up for us here. Okay. So yeah, just a few things and we can run through these pretty quickly, but these are just some, you know, kind of like the, quick trip to exceeding our expectations. These are kind of just the takeaways uh, for anybody who just wants to kind of have a little checklist on these. We've talked about a lot of these, so I'll go over them quickly, but the attitude, that's more important than a technical skill. You can learn technical skills. It's the attitude. Um, you can learn the hard way, the attitude piece. But I think that having that positive, energetic, um, uh, solution-oriented attitude will set you apart um, more than anything else. Uh, there are, there is that squeaky wheel syndrome and you'll stumble over at some point. That person who has the squeaky wheel is, um, and sometimes it is valuable to be squeaky if you're not getting recognized in a certain wheel, uh, way. So do it if you need to, but if, if all you are is squeaky, then it's a one-time deal. So don't worry about that person. Keep, keep on the track. Uh, be an enabler. Enable everybody around you. Think beyond yourself. We've spoken about this, uh, to a certain extent today. So, don't worry about it if it seems to build up somebody else. You're the one that's um, exhibiting that leadership quality. So be that enabler and, and develop that reputation to uh, be that person. Add value and stretch yourself, um, especially as you're building in and getting opportunities within a new space. Uh, if you're invited to a meeting or coming on to a project team and you're kind of earning your stripes on that one, add a little something extra, always be prepared and then stretch yourself. Don't be afraid of uh, working outside your 
comfort zone. Don't pretend like you have a skill that you don't have. Ask questions and, and, and get that guidance that you need and be open about it. But definitely don't be afraid of stretching yourself. Honestly, that's where it all happens. Uh, build a reputation of it, accountability and quality. I think that kind of speaks for itself. But just always take ownership. If something goes wrong, acknowledge it and address it and just, you know, verbalize that as you're working to correct this. You're taking ownership and, and moving it forward. Do all of this with humility and inquiry. I say that <laughs> with those words because I think it's just a, a nice reminder to say, you know, you can feel really confident you're having a great day. You just nailed it today, but still always be humble and and seek out those opportunities to um, um, engage and listen to learn from those around you. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. I, responsiveness and, and uh, reliability, I'm sorry, I jumped over that one, but we can keep it right here. With that one, I think that kind of speaks to itself, but that's the one where you're, you'll be the one that gets the call back. You're the one who's going to be, if you're always the person who responds and provides value in your, your response, that client's going to be calling you back because they know they can rely on you for that one. Mm -hmm. um, this one, the problems, challenges, opportunities, you're going to have a lot of just challenging situations or, you know, really painful clients or things like that. We talked about this a little bit before, but consider those challenges and then relay them as opportunities. Um, if you can develop this as a challenge for yourself to move forward, you've all made it through a thousand challenges in your lives. You can do this. Others have done it as well. You can do this with grace and then relay it as opportunities as you're bringing the solution forward to that client or to your supervisor or whatever. Relay it as we have the opportunity for growth. Yes, we have just lost this contract. What a great opportunity is for us to um, review our lessons learned and come back with a better communication with a better team. You know, it's you can use it with any uh, scenario, and I'll tell you that I have. <laughs> I use this in every, every type of conversation. So it's it, it it can be something that picks you up out of the mud um, really easily. Calibrate yourself, recalibrate yourself often. We've we've spoken at length about this today, but this is uh, beyond a doubt. You know, just something that the SWOT analysis is. What, people that are that are 20 years in the industry are doing this, and and you know it doesn't matter where you are in your career. If you're successful, you are by all means recalibrating and making you know maintaining that self awareness um, so that you can carry that forward. Diligence and communication. We've spoken about this at length as well, but. Um, you know, ultimately, this comes from the verbal communication, written communication, and then just the diligence and understanding that communication is the key. So just don't ever short shift the communication piece of whatever you're working on. Make sure that your messaging is clear. Make sure that if you're responding to comments that you are responding to them, not just, you know, addressing them. That shows that you're, you know, committed to uh, improving, that you're open to feedback and, you know, et cetera. Um, and then learn to flex with the communication style. This could be a whole topic on itself, but um, really this is the ability to, you know, whoever you're trying to persuade, learn their communication style or interpret their communication style so that you can pivot with them. And if it doesn't work at the start, try something else. So pivot, that's what I call the pivot, where you, you're you working with um, a challenging situation, a challenging person, or maybe you've been rejected. Pivot and try something else. Um, and then beyond a doubt, integrity, authenticity, character. This I, I say this, this it's kind of Pollyanna to um, kind of say, of course, do everything with integrity, which I do believe. However, this is actually a tip for yourself. If you act with integrity in everything you do and you can always justify why you did something objectively, then that is a that's a shortcut for yourself to be able to respond to any situation to avoid those personality conflicts. This is this is your um, easy street to say. You might not have liked how that went, but this is why I did it. If it was it wrong? Well, this was my intention, and I've, I apologize for this. This is what I wanted to do. How can I do it better? But you can always rely on the integrity and authenticity piece. And then not, gratitude. Gratitude I'd put on anything. Thank the people around you. Be gracious to the people around you. Smile. <laughs> Smile is the undervalued feel of the office environment but um get your mentors and just be grateful for them your your colleagues that you feel competitive with be grateful for them to offer you those challenges even the painful clients you know just be grateful for for the process if you get invited to a, a meeting or be part of a group or you're given a new role be grateful follow up say how did that go did, what, did i offer good value um to that so which i think goes to the last slide that i wanted to uh kind of run through quickly here 
Those are all yeah, those are the last ones. Really okay. great. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that, that this was kind of the, that last concept of having a seat at the table. I think that this is just um, you'll be given opportunities. So this is kind of a, an analogy for any of those types of scenarios. So bring your value to the table, but allow for others other seats to fill those gaps that you have uh, and appreciate that. Um, bring what you can. Don't pretend to be something that you're not. And then and then have that be the value of of what's coming together around the table. Um, welcome learning from others. Um, that's that's where you're you're this is kind of I, I'm a planner. I can say this part, but if we're talking biology, I'm going to lean on that biologist next to me or, or if we're talking operations, I want to lean on our operational lead over here. Um, be humble, um, but interested and active. So bringing that this, this also can mean that you're not always talking. <laughs> So you're, you're doing a lot more listening, and that's fine. You do not have to drive every conversation, especially if you're coming into it. But if you are talking, bring value to that. Um, ask questions. You also might be a dot connector. And what I mean by that is be the person to say, what I heard you say this, what I heard you say is this. Here's what I would add to that conversation. Or otherwise, I was on a conversation. I was in a meeting yesterday, and this was brought up. I think this would add a great value here. If you're bringing something that nobody else at the table can bring and you're you're bringing these discussions together you've you've added a value they didn't have without you and then again just be be gracious and, and um, be thankful for uh, each of the steps uh, the person who invited you to that meeting so to speak follow up say how did that go you know is there anything that I, I can do to improve I would really like to be at the next meeting I, I really appreciate this opportunity I'd really like to be uh, considered for this in the future those were kind of my uh, quick tips <laughs> Excellent. Those are all very good. Um, we're over time, so we wrap it up. The next webinar I have here, October 2nd, um, that may be changing, so make sure you double check. Um, and Leslie and I would love for you to connect with us on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, follow up. I don't think either one of us is very scary. Feel free to <laughs> approach us and connect. And uh, thank you, Leslie, for being on here and sharing all this wonderful insight with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was fun. And um, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Everybody have a great evening. <laughs>